Please open in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 6. And if you'll stand with me, we'll read verses 19 through 24. So if you'll stand, Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 24, where Jesus really begins to discuss how it is that we can live profitably in this kingdom, as it were, or on earth, in the earthly kingdom, without really being a part of the earthly kingdom. We are to live as kingdom citizens in a world that claims it's, uh, us for its kingdom. So how do we do this? Uh, Matthew chapter 6, verse 19. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. So then if your eye is clear, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light that is in you is darkness, how great is the darkness. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. Please be seated. I had the privilege this week of going camping at Indian Boundary State Park with my three girls. It was their fall break. And also, we were able to invite to join us Kevin Gross and his four girls along with uh, Aaron Webb, who we added in just for fun. So we had two dads and eight girls. We left the moms at home so that they could have a time of rest and relaxation, although with all the girls with us, I'm not sure how restful and relaxing it was. As we were at the campsite, people, we had you know, eight bikes out in the front of the campsite and the girls running around having a great time. People would walk by and go, what's the matter with you guys? And, and, and where, where are the wives <laughs> was their question. Well, the Lord is good to us. We brought all the girls back home safely and, and it was a joyful time of fellowship. But Early one morning, I went down to the lake uh, to go running, and I was up a little bit too early. I was hoping that the sun it wouldn't be fully up, I knew, but would cast enough light so that I could see to run on the trail. But without enough light, it was, again, the, the sun, sun really hadn't cast any light yet at all, still almost pitch black. Without enough light, of course, I was afraid to run, because although I could see kind of the broad outline of the path, I couldn't make out the rocks and roots and the uneven ground that were sure to cause me to fall or to sprain my ankle, which I do easily. Now, I had a headlamp with me, but even that wasn't really sufficient because the light it shed was, it was too localized for me to adjust quickly enough to avoid the, the obstructions and, and the difficulty. I needed the sun to illumine my eyes so that I could see where I was going. Well, apart from Christ, in the kingdom of darkness, it is as though we are trying to run on a path without illumination. Our hearts are hardened so that they value the wrong things. Our minds are darkened so that we do not properly understand what is valuable. See, this is especially true in relation to, to our material possessions and our monetary wealth, those things that are, are so easy for us to clutch, so tangible for us, our money and our stuff. that really provide for us, what, our pleasure and our position, our power, those sorts of things. So, so easy to be distracted by those and really to be darkened by those things. That's an illustration that Jesus is going to use that we will see this morning. The kingdom citizen, however, has been given a new heart. This includes a new mind and must properly be exercised in order to store up treasure that has eternal value. So as we began last week and as we'll see again this week, the kingdom citizen has been given a new heart and a new mind which must be carefully guarded against valuing the treasures of this world and directed towards exclusively pursuing the treasures of heaven. Again, the kingdom citizen has been given a new heart and a new mind which must be carefully guarded against valuing the treasures of this world and directed towards exclusively pursuing the treasures of heaven. Now, in chapter 6 of Matthew, Jesus has been assaulting, confronting the external righteousness of the Pharisee. Now, he's not condemning acts of righteousness. He's condemning acts of hypocritical self-righteousness. And we saw that as he talked about giving and prayer and fasting, and really as he brought out the nature of true righteousness. And we saw in those illustrations that true righteousness is empowered by God. It is only he who can give the necessary strength and wisdom and, and really, really bring any power at all to do even a single act of righteousness. Those in the kingdom are the only ones who can really do anything that is righteous at all. Those outside of it, the Pharisees at this time, weren't able to do anything righteous. The best that they could do was an external act of righteousness to be rewarded by men. So true righteousness, we saw, is always empowered by God. But also we saw that true righteousness is witnessed by God. Remember, he kept telling the Pharisees, look, you are doing your, or pursuing your acts of righteousness to be seen by men. And men will see righteousness, but that's not the audience we want. Because men can't truly understand, appreciate, or reward 
True righteousness, only God can. And that's the third thing that we learned, that true righteousness is rewarded by God. He is the one who empowers it. He is the one who is the audience for it. And he is the one who rewards it. It isn't that others don't benefit from it, but they are not the primary reason for our acts of righteousness. It is before our God to be rewarded by him, to bring him the honor and glory that he so richly deserves. And now Jesus transitions in verse 19. And I I think the thought is, as he's talked about the reward that only the Father can bring, almost like he's answering a question. Okay, how do we exercise, how do we, how do we gain that reward? How do we live out that reward in a world that so quickly and, and powerfully tries to conform us to its mold? Trying to live within this kingdom and, and the things we need, our food and, and clothing and even the money we need to survive, how do we keep a kingdom perspective? How do we keep seeking the reward that only God can bring? And so he's going to use a series of illustrations to draw out how it is that we can continue to build our treasure in heaven to gain a true reward. So he says in verse 19, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal. He says in verse 22, the eye is the lamp of the body. If your eye is clear, your whole body will be full of light. He says in verse 24, no one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other or be devoted to the one and despise the other. So really the three questions he's asking, where is your treasure? Where are you storing it? So by virtue of that illustration of of treasure stored in a particular place. But then in verse 21, he says, or verse 22, where is, or how is your vision? Is your vision clear? Is your eye clear so that you can properly understand the things of kingdom value? And then in verse 24, he says, who are you serving? What master is directing and driving you? So the three underlying realities here are what does your heart value, what does your mind understand, and who does your will serve? Two treasures and two visions and two masters. Well, we began the two treasures last week. And in verse 19, he contrasted the treasures stored up on earth to the treasures stored up in heaven. So he really, the first command he gives if we're going to have profitable kingdom living is that we have to safely store our treasure. We have to have true riches that will last for eternity because that's where we're headed. We're all headed for eternity. Either eternity apart from God in hell, eternal punishment, or eternity with God, serving him and honoring him in a perfect relationship. He says, you had best, knowing this eternal reality, you had best safely store your treasure. And so, of course, he told them, don't store up your treasure on earth. So that's on your outline, safely store your treasure And the place that you are not to store up your treasure is to store it on earth. Why? Because moths eat it. Rust destroys it. Thieves take it. That is, it decays or it's taken. And even if you manage to get through your life with your clothes intact and a measure of worldly wealth, what happens? You die and someone else gets it. And then eventually it decays or rots or is taken from them and it goes on and on. And of course, in the ultimate sense, at the end of the age, it's all gone. Every bit of it. And so don't store it up here because it cannot last. Instead, store up your treasures in heaven. Why? Because those treasures last. Those are the eternal ones. Those are the things that cannot decay. They cannot rust or be eaten by moths. They cannot be taken. No one will storm the gates of heaven and take from God the treasures that he is holding for us. We talked about the eternal inheritance that we have in 1 Peter. That is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for us. Now, We did flesh this out a bit because this is probably one of the most familiar passages in all of the Bible. There are probably not one of you sitting here who has said, wow, I'm to store up my treasures in heaven. I never heard that before. So we tried to to get underneath it a little bit to say, "What what is Jesus saying about how it is that we could actually store up treasures on earth? Well, we could do sinful things that never has any earthly value, or we can do the things that aren't in and of themselves sinful in a sinful manner or in a manner that doesn't bring glory to God, which is the same. Anything that falls short of the glory of God is what? Sin. That's the definition of it. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So we can do religious things we talked about and social things, and, and we can pursue our material wealth all in ways that store up only earthly treasure. However, we can, as we saw, store up treasure in heaven by doing righteous things, the things that Scripture commands, and then by using the things of the earth that are not in and of themselves sinful or righteous, in ways that honor and please the Lord, our social standing and our relationships, even the the things of worship that can be either righteous or unrighteous, we are to use them with the proper motivation to glorify God, with the proper desire to to see his church built and to do so all in, in, in humble dependence upon him. 
So our religious actions, our worship, our, our, our pursuit of worship, our pursuit of our, our social standing and our pursuit of relationships, and even our pursuit of material things, how it is that we pursue money, how it is that we accumulate things, that can be done to please the Lord. In fact, must be done. You all are accumulating money to some degree so you can eat food tomorrow. You all have a place to live and a car to drive. Those aren't inherently ungodly. So pursue them in a way that pleases the Lord. Because then, when those things rot, you have used them to have eternal treasure. What an amazing thought. If you only use them for here, then everything rots and your treasure is lost. If you use the things of earth to build treasure in heaven, you get benefit now from them, and you get benefit eternally. What an amazing thing to be a Christian. So safely store your treasure. And he told them where to store. Not on earth, but in heaven. But now in verse 20, excuse me, verse 21, he tells them why. Why is this so important? Now, we've already alluded to it, but he really gets to, he, he digs down to the central issue. And that is, this is so important, and he uses the word for. Build up, don't store up your treasures on earth. Store them up in heaven for, or here's the reason, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Now, again, treasure is just the accumulated wealth. Right? Whatever it is, if it's earthly treasures, or then the earthly treasures used for heavenly gain, where your treasure is, where the things you truly value are, and where you have, the, the place you have stored those things up, where that is, that's where your heart is. And the heart, we need to define it a little bit because the world essentially defines the heart as emotions. Right? So if you have, you emote from your heart. If your heart is in it, you have, you have deep emotion about it. In fact, Pixar just recently put out a film which was all about the being driven by emotions. In fact, the, the mind was viewed as the control center of the mind was viewed entirely by emotion. There's nothing that could be further from the truth. There's a fundamental misunderstanding of how it is that we're actually to live what actually drives a person. A person is not to be driven by emotion. And in fact, really isn't. Emotions are the things that, are, that flow out of the mind and the will and the affections, the things that underlie emotion. And of course, the world knows nothing of this, but that's what the heart is. The heart is the intellect, where we reason, where we understand. The heart is the desire. That is what we delight in. The heart is the will, when we, where we purpose to do things. The heart is the affections, those things that truly draw our gaze, those things that are truly delightful or beautiful to us. That's the heart. And it is the heart that must be watched over, says Proverbs 4.23, with all diligence, for from it flow the springs of life. It's the command center of who we are. It is really the core of who we are. That's our heart. It's our inner man. So he says, where your treasure is, there is really essentially, that's where every part of you is. And he, he's, uh, he's addressing the treasures first because that's how he's been doing this. He says, look, don't store up your treasure here, store it up here. Because where your treasure is, your heart is. But he isn't saying that if you put your treasure in the right place, then your heart will end up in the right place. Instead, he's just using that treasure to draw us to the real issue, which is what? Where you're storing your treasure indicates the actual condition of your heart already. That is, spiritual problems are always heart problems. The location of our treasure always indicates where our heart already was. Sinful acts, as John MacArthur, come from a sinful heart, just as righteous acts come from a righteous heart. Matthew 12:34. Speaking again to the Pharisees, you brood of vipers, how can you, being evil, speak what is good? For the mouth speaks out of that which fills the heart. The decisions you make in your heart, the desires you have in your heart, the affections, all of that flows out through your mouth. And of course, in your actions, all that is linked to your heart. Matthew 15, 18. But the things that proceed out of the mouth come from the heart. And those defile the man. Not, not the outward things. Oh, what's in the heart defiles the man. For out of the heart come evil thoughts. Notice, the, again, the focus on the, the nature of our thinking. Murders, adulteries, fornications, our lustfulness, our will and desires and affections, thefts, false witnesses, slanders from a darkened heart or an unregenerate heart, a heart that is tainted with sin, come sinful things in our thinking, in our will, and in our affections. But Matthew 12, 35, Jesus says a very interesting thing. The good man brings out of his good treasure what is good, and the evil man brings out of his evil tre treasure what is evil. He's not talking about material things. Again, it's, the, it's a metaphor. And he talked about the fact that the good man has a good treasure, and he brings what is good out of that. The picture is, those are the good things that the Lord has worked in the heart. When the heart is changed, renewed, then the man has something good to bring. It's almost as though the treasure has been brought inside, and the man can then bring those treasures out 
and only one who's been changed. That's the good man. He's not talking about, well, someone who is morally good, because there are no morally, there is no true moral goodness that is of any lasting value. It is only the goodness that has been placed there by the work of God in the heart. And so that man can bring out treasure which is good. And that's fascinating. It's almost like God takes the treasure, and really takes, remember in Ephesians uh, 2.10 was to say, that God has stored up or prepared for us the good works that we are to do. He's prepared beforehand. So it's almost like he takes those, puts them inside as the Spirit comes to live inside. Then we work those out so that we store up the treasure. We take it from inside, as it were, and it, it has eternal benefit for us. He puts it in, we work it out, and we receive eternal benefit for it. The evil man, however, has nothing but evil treasure, as it were. The riches of this world, the things he has stored up here, and the nature of his sinful heart. He brings out of his evil treasure what is evil. That's all he has the man apart from Christ, the man who's not in the kingdom, has no treasure, has no good treasure whatsoever to bring. And that all has to do with the heart. So the things that you value reveal the condition of your heart. If you value worldly things and thus store up your treasures in the world, this indicates that your basic nature or your heart is most satisfied with those worldly things. And that's on your outline. Why to store up your treasure safely? Because the place of your treasure indicates the condition of your heart. And you know this to be true. You walk into a man's home or a man and woman's home, and you, you can fairly quickly find out what's important to them. And so you look and you see, a man says, oh, I love my family, and you, he ushers you into his office, and there he has his trophies of the things he's accomplished, and he has all of his certificates up on the wall, the things that he's done. And where's his family? Maybe a couple pictures on the, you know, in the back. Man. Other men, you might draw them in, and actually you would see those things. You guys, you can tell where people's heart is by the things you observe about them but probably most clearly by the things they say, right? You can spend time with someone for 10, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, half an hour, and pretty quickly you can discover what is actually important to them because it comes out. You can't hide it. What does the Bible say? We speak out of that which fills our heart. Yes, and you can hide it for a certain amount of time. You can hide it from me, certainly from the pulpit. I can be standing here looking at you, and I don't know your heart. Even if I spend time with you, I'm not the one that makes the final determination about your heart, but I tell you this. I can tell the things that drive you. And if I can tell them, and you know the things that drive one another when you spend time, if you know that, I tell you that certainly your Heavenly Father, in a much more foundational and, and, and with absolute perfection, He knows what's going on in your heart. Yes. And so I would say this, please, please, don't sit you know, this morning and in, in the mornings to come with, with a heart that, whose condition has not been truly changed thinking that somehow you're, you're faking people out, that somehow it's going to be okay, that somehow people won't know. Because God already knows, so you might as well change your heart. Now, the problem is, because I'm convinced that the vast majority of you are sitting here because, no, my heart has been changed. The condition of my heart is that I long to store up treasure in heaven. It's, it's been regenerated. I, I long for the things of the Lord. But some of you may yet be fooling yourself. You may think that that is the case, and yet you aren't actually finding true pleasure in the things of the Lord. You're doing them. You're, you're pursuing religiosity or worship, even by coming here, but your heart hasn't actually been changed at all. And you will find that over time what happens is you're frustrated and, and angry and depressed and discouraged, not actually finding great joy in the things of the Lord. And maybe that's you this morning. And maybe you need to consider carefully whether your heart has been changed, whether you have, Matthew 5, 8, been made by the Lord's grace and through the truth of the gospel and the spirit working in your heart, whether your heart has been made pure. Matthew 5, 8 says, blessed are the pure in heart. Remember that from the very beginning? As we talk about who gets into the kingdom, blessed are the pure in heart. Those who, whom God, God has purified their heart says they shall see God. So don't fool yourself. And, th and consider carefully the condition of your heart. And that's why Jesus is bringing this message and why well, I'm proclaiming it this morning is because you need to look at what you are valuing, where you are actually storing your treasure, and that's going to reveal to you the nature of your heart. Take stock this morning. What is actually valuable to you? How is that demonstrated in how you use your time, in the way that you pursue the things that you do? Because it's not how much time necessarily is apportioned to each thing. Nobody comes to church as much, well, except me maybe, because it's my job. But, but nobody comes to church as much as they go to work, right? They can't say, well, I'm spending this much time at work and this much time at church, so my, no. It is how you pursue your work, how even you come to church, the things that you surround in your free time, how you use those. What's the true condition of your heart? That's where Jesus is driving. 
And the condition of your heart is known by where you are storing your treasure, in what ways you are seeking the things of the Lord. And that's really the second point here. The pursuit of your treasure indicates the focus of your heart. Although the condition of our hearts may be regenerate, and I believe that's true for most everyone here. As true believers in Christ, we are still capable of focusing our hearts on things that are earthly and worldly. We have a regenerate heart, but our inner man, there's still sin that remains in our flesh, and so we can improperly focus our mind or our desires or our affections. And and for that reason, we have to be very careful to constantly focus on the things of eternal value. It takes work and effort on our part, strengthened by the Spirit of God through the principles of the Word of God. The kinds of things we most actively and adamantly pursue reveal the primary focus of our hearts, which may reveal either unbelief or weak belief, a a weak faith. And maybe that's your problem as well. You've heard the word, you, you come to church over and over, but you still, the focus of your heart in many areas is upon yourself or upon the things that you can gain. Believers can do this, and they are harmed deeply by it. Turn to Colossians chapter 3. We'll get a picture of this, Colossians 3. Here Paul is speaking, really he's flowing out of all the things that Christ has done and the fact that he has canceled out the certificate of debt and he, he has, has triumphed over all the rulers and authorities. He says, verse 3, or chapter 3, verse 1, Therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. So raised up with Christ, that's every believer. We are in Christ. We have been given his new life. We are raised to new life with him, says Romans 6 in this passage. And it is viewed, as we see in Ephesians chapter 2, and here as though we are, as it were, seated with Christ. We, we are receiving the blessings and benefits that Christ receives. And we receive that in, in, as it were, we might call it a positional way, that God views us in Christ and he grants us access and grants us these blessings. But notice what it says. If this is true, if you've been raised up with Christ, then keep seeking the things above. It's not automatic. We have to continue to pursue those things. We have to keep on seeking them. And that is, again, not simply missionary work or or full-time vocational Christian ministry. That's not the things above. The things above is pursuing anything and everything we do according to the principles of Scripture, the principles of heaven, as it were, which are revealed to us in the Word of God and illumined, as we will see, by the power of God. We have to keep doing this. He, gets, he commands us in verse 2, set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on earth. It is so easy to do, to put our focus and our attention and our direction towards earthly things. Guys, I understand that. That's why Jesus is preaching this, saying, look, you, know, you can't get your reward from men, but it's so easy to do, so make sure you understand where your treasure is and what your treasure is, and make sure your heart desires that Focus yourself, set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on earth, for you have died. That old person is dead. The old man, the the old nature has been crucified, and you have been hidden. It says your life is hidden with Christ and God. But again, the reality as we continue to live is sin remains. And so we have to continually exert our effort to pursue this treasure, and that indicates where our heart is actually focused. Consider your work. Is your heart focused on pleasing the Lord in your work, whether it's in the home, whether it's in, in, at a job, in the workplace, somewhere, wherever it might be, or is your heart focused on just getting the work done or accomplishing the rewards that you get, receiving the rewards you get from the work or receiving advancement in the work? Where's the focus? In your enjoyment, in your pleasure, where's the focus? Just on the pleasure? You know, when we went out camping, it could have been, so we want to focus on the earth and on the beauty of the lake, and it could have been that. But by the Lord's grace, it wasn't. We enjoyed that. But we were there to honor and please the Lord, even as we were out camping with our kids and and to encourage them and to point them to Christ and build each other up. What a blessing. See, believers focus on everything differently. Everything is to have a heavenly, as it were, focus. Not that we're out of this world or, or, or not thinking of what we're doing, but we're thinking through it in a scriptural, biblical context. Now, this is, well, an illustration of this is Moses himself. In Hebrews 11, 26, as he considered the reproach of Christ greater treasure or greater riches than the treasures of Egypt. I mean, if anyone could have gotten distracted or maybe should have been distracted by the treasures of the world, it's Moses. Very early on, he enters into Pharaoh's household, perhaps even as, as someone close to the throne. He has all of those blessings and benefits. I mean, and what did he have as a, as a child of, of, of God or as a child of, of Israel? I mean, 
slavery, difficulty. They had to work and, and, and make bricks and were, they were enslaved to the Pharaoh. I mean, he had that choice. Do I go to this or do I receive all the blessings and benefits of the world? Where am I going to focus? And he focused on the treasure that was eternal. Ultimately, on the treasures that Christ provides. He focused on the things that were promised, the things that were coming. It says, for he was looking to the reward. That is not the earthly reward, but the heavenly one. He knew better. And he focused on those things. Guys, how's your focus? The condition of your heart is vital. You can't focus on the things of the Lord if you haven't been changed. The repentance and faith, the work of the Spirit of God, applying the gospel to your heart. But then you need to focus your heart carefully in every area on the things of the Lord, on the things that are eternal. Yeah, so often the church has tried to actually store up treasures on earth. In fact, that's one of the main knocks against the church over the ages if you look back in church history. Storing up treasures and riches like somehow the kingdom was here and at the time during one of the Roman persecutions that soldiers broke into a certain church to confiscate its presumed treasures. What a tragedy that people would think that the church is trying to store up riches for itself in an earthly sense. I mean, we just built a new middle level, but you guys, one, you're not going to go down there and go, wow, I mean, that's the most glitzy, amazing, you know, we have gold lining on our, on, you know, on our, on our bathroom stalls. It's functional. It looks nice. That's for the purpose of ministry. We're not storing up treasures here. But, but these, these, these Roman, uh, this Roman army broke in thinking that it would find treasure. And an elder in the church is said to have pointed to a group of widows and orphans who are being fed and said, these are the treasures of the church as we accomplish the things that please the heart of our Lord, as we minister to his people, as we focus on the things that are heavenly, that's our treasure, not the stuff that's here. We use the stuff here to bring glory and honor to our Lord. The per pursuit of your treasure indicates the focus of your heart. And I would say this. I, I believe this is all bound up in the concept of pursuing wisdom. You see, one of the primary ways we focus our hearts on heavenly treasure is to pursue the truths of Scripture, which is biblical wisdom. It is only wisdom that allows us to live a life which grows in conformity to the image of Christ. Remember the, the images used in, in Proverbs concerning riches. How much better is it to get wisdom than gold? And to get understanding is to be chosen above silver. Because we are to long to think wisely, to think truthfully about the, the nature of our world and to honor and please Christ because we're driven by true wisdom. Colossians 1, 9, and 10. So if you're still in Colossians, just turn back. Colossians 1. It says, For this reason also, since the day we heard of it, we have not ceased to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with what? The knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding. We need to have wisdom. We need to have spiritual wisdom and understanding. I'm not talking about the wisdom of the world. I'm not talking about another degree or going back to school or learning more on the internet. Or just being smart about things. You know, I'm, 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 I've got good common sense. Not that kind of wisdom. The wisdom which views everything according to biblical principles and tries to put them into practice in the most effective way possible. That's how our hearts are properly focused towards storing up treasure in heaven. Anything that is biblically wise is something that stores up treasure for all of eternity. It's beneficial here for living for Christ, and it's beneficial for eternity because true wisdom is found in what? In Christ. That's what Colossians says. In Christ are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Colossians 2, 3. So we want this biblical and spiritual wisdom and understanding. And if you could move on into verse 10 of Colossians 1, so that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, to please him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God, growing more in your understanding. And then thirdly, I would say, as it relates to our heart, and really, again, I think our heart here would be primarily focused upon our desires, the, the things that, that, that we believe will bring us pleasure, that the balance of your treasure indicates the health of your heart. So while it is true that just, you know, if you get your treasure stored in the right places, your heart will follow it, excuse me, it's, th that isn't true. So if you try to get your treasure and say, well, I'll do these good things and hopefully my heart will follow, no, your heart has to be right first. But it is true that if you begin to build your treasures in an earthly way, which even believers can do, that your heart tends to get drawn away or distracted by that. And so as a believer, you might do an analysis this morning of what is the balance of treasure in your heart. That is, in your inner man, what, is, what delights you more? What is, what is that balance? Because there's something called a divided heart in Scripture where we are you know, pursuing the things of the world and we also want to you know, tack on the things of Christ. What's the balance of your desire? 
Are the great, is the greater portion of your desire centered around the things of, of the Lord Jesus, pursuing the things that please and honor him? Or is it still that even as a believer, there's large portions, a large balance of your desire which isn't directed towards the things of the Lord? That will indicate the health of your heart. The more you balance or the more you place weight upon earthly things, your heart will be drawn in that direction. And the more you place your, you, you balance your treasures out, that is putting them all in, in the heavenly bank, as it were, the more your heart will be drawn in that way as well. Romans 13, 11 says, Do this, knowing the time, that it is already the hour for you to awaken from sleep. For now salvation is nearer to us than when we believe. The night is almost gone. The day is near. Let us lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave properly as in the day, not in carousing and drunkenness not in sexual promiscuity and sensuality, not in strife and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lusts. We put him on, and therefore our desires are conformed to his. But that image that we find there in Romans 13 of light and darkness now takes us to the next metaphor that Jesus uses. And it kind of crashes in on us unexpectedly. It's almost like this was grabbed from another place maybe and stuck into the text, which is what some people say. So go look back in your text in, in Matthew 6. He's talking about treasures in heaven, where your treasure is, where, where your desires are, there you're, you know, or, or where, you, where, you've, where the object of your desire is, that indicates what your true desires are, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And then verse 22, the eye is the lamp of the body. Well, where, I mean, where in the world does that come from? So someone said, yeah, you know, it's, just, it's uh, someone putting together the Gospels and they grabbed that from something else Jesus said and they kind of stuck it here. I don't believe that for a moment. This isn't how the Gospels were put together. This is a sermon of Christ that he gave that was recorded by Matthew. And so this is what he said next. And he said this next because it gives a very vibrant illustration of another aspect of our hearts. There's the desires of our hearts, the things that delight us, and there's also our understanding of what is valuable. And that's where he goes next. And he uses the illustration of the eye and then of light and dark for us to understand how important it is that we properly think about the things of this world and the things of heaven so that we value the right thing. So that would be next, is carefully, or be carefully clear your sight. The second illustration Jesus gives of how to receive true reward has to do with this metaphor involving the human eye as really representative of the heart and a particular aspect of the heart. In the first metaphor, he asks, where is your treasure? What does your heart value? What do you desire? In the second metaphor, he asked the question, how is your vision? What does your mind understand? In the first metaphor, we have two kinds of treasure. In this one, we have two kinds of eyes, or really two kinds of visions, but they're directly linked. You have to desire the right things. You have to understand the right things in order to be able to pursue heavenly treasure and be profitable here on earth. So first, he just gives the organ of sight. That is, what do we see with? And remember, each of these is metaphorical. They're, they're real things, but he's using them to draw us to spiritual realities. So, in our text, in verse 22, the eye is the lamp of the body. Again, even that's kind of a strange metaphor, because a lamp does what? It gives off light, and your eyes don't give off light. It's not like twinkling eyes. It's not what he's talking about. But I think the best way to understand it, and, and by the way, lamp would have been very familiar to them, not so much to us. I mean, we have flashlights, and my girls loved running around with their headlamps and things like that, but this kind of lamp was, it would be an oil lamp, a small container, a wick extended from one end, and it burned oil in order to give light, and it gave off a pretty small and pretty smoky light. And yet, it was the only light there was. It's hard for us to, to get a hold of how important light was in the culture of Jesus' time, because there was, you didn't just walk in the house and flip on the lights with the electricity. When, it, when the sun went down in, in, in that society, there, there was very little light, almost none. You, you couldn't walk on the streets. It was very dangerous because there was no light. You went into your house, there was no light there. You had to light these lamps. Light was vital, and so it was a very powerful illustration. For us, it's just a little harder to get a hold of. Again, back to my camping trip. That's one of the neat things to do when you go camping is what? There's no light, or there's very little. And so as, as things get dark, you can actually see the stars. That's kind of exciting, but also you've got to carry your own little light around, or you bump into things. It's kind of the whole idea. Well, guys, so when Jesus says, look, th there's a lamp, it gives off light, and your eye is like that, he was really referencing two powerful illustrations. One, the need of a lamp for light and, and illumination. So necessary in that society. Light is equally necessary for us. It's just, it's just we have more of it. But also, he then relates that to the eye, one of the most dreaded things that could possibly happen to anyone in Bible times, and really has been true for, for most of history, is to be blind. That the eye 
would not work. When you were blind, you were done. You sat on the edge of the road and you begged for the rest of your life if you were lucky, if you even survived long enough to do that. Blindness was terrifying because with no light, with no ability to see, you couldn't do anything. There was no social net, no programs. The church ultimately became one of the greatest providers for those who were blind and sick and poor. And, and the church became and has traditionally been the means by which people are cared for. But the world doesn't care for them. It didn't. So both of these illustrations, the lamp that gives off light, then related to the eye, which receives the light and illuminates inside. So it seems, it's almost a reverse metaphor. The lamp sheds the light. The eye is like the lamp in that it brings the light and sheds it inside so that we are able to see and pursue the things that we need to. Well, in a spiritual sense then, the eye really functions as a part of the heart. And in Ephesians 1.18, what does it say? I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. Paul actually uses almost a, the, the same metaphor, not as directly or he, more directly even than Jesus. Jesus uses it indirectly, but I believe he's using it to say your eye, your, the, the nature, the understanding of your heart has to be illumined. If your eye is bad, if your spiritual eye is dark, if you're spiritually blind, then you can't see anything properly. And one of the primary indications of that is when you are ruled by worldly wealth. When the things of this world are the only things you see, as it were, that indicates your blindness. And it's devastating, as Jesus will say. So if your heart's bad, your treasure's going to be stored up wrongly. If your eye is bad, then you're not going to understand what is valuable, and you're going to store up treasures wrongly as well. So the organ of sight was the eye, but really in this metaphor, it's our heart. And specifically, it's the nature of the heart, I think, that is addressed through the intellect. That's most often how the, how, how the Bible uses light and dark as it relates to our inner man. Turn to Ephesians 4 to kind of get a picture for this. In Ephesians 4, we have this picture of darkness that's related to an understanding that is, is, uh, has, has been dulled. It cannot see. So Ephesians chapter 4, beginning in verse 17. So this I say and affirm together with the Lord that you walk no longer as the Gentiles also walk in the futility of their mind, here it is, being darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardness of their hearts. So the heart and the intellect are related together. When there is ignorance and, and foolishness, it's because we don't properly understand, because our understanding has been dulled and darkened. In fact, the eyes of our heart have been shut off. They've been blinded. We come into the world that way. Our eyes are blind. They cannot see. It goes on to say, having become callous, they have given themselves over to sensuality for the practice of every kind of impurity with greediness. But look at verse 20 of Ephesians 4. But you did not learn Christ in this way. When the Holy Spirit comes and through the word of God, he, he renews the heart, the intellect, the, the mind is renewed so we can actually learn of Christ and see his value and understand that he is worth following follows along or comes along with the renewing of our desire to seek after him and our affections to delight in him. That's what happens when our heart is renewed. Jesus is saying, look, if your eye is dark, then you will never be able to pursue spiritual treasure or heavenly treasure. Only if your eye is clear are you going to be able to do that. And that really relates to what we understand to be true. So the clarity of our sight, he says, so then, he says, look, the lamp of the body is the eye. And for us, it is our, our heart and our internally in this metaphor, it is, it is there, our spiritual understanding. He says, if your eye is clear, then your whole body will be full of light. Again, a very powerful example. If you're blind, you see nothing, but if your eyes are working, and, and I think clear there, it's a very interesting word. It can be translated things like sincere or generous, and some have translated it that way. But all the major translations have something either like clear, which is the eye is properly working. It's not clouded by cataracts, which are common in our day, but were tremendously common in, in Christ's day, where people constantly had eye problems and eye difficulties that kept them from seeing well. They didn't have the medicines we have today. It happens to us as we get older, but it happened then. Very young, people couldn't see, and their eyes were not clear. And uh, the New King James, ESV, NIV translate either healthy or good, and I think that's the right idea. If your eyes working properly seems to be Jesus' whole uh, emphasis here. That is your physical eye. But that also then relates directly to his metaphor, our spiritual eye. Can we properly understand the value of heavenly things because we understand the value of Christ? If we don't, all right, if we do, then our whole body will be full of light. That is, everything can be properly seen. You got it. If you don't understand 
scriptural truth, if you don't understand the nature of Christ and his value, then everything else is lost to you. You won't pursue wisdom. You won't find delight in Christ. You won't see him as valuable if you don't understand the truths and principles about him and his work that are found here. The Spirit of God does that work and enables us to be, as it were, full of light. Now, what warrant do I have for seeing the spiritual metaphor? Well, I think it's the only way to make sense of this text. He's not just all of a sudden start talking about, well, you know, you need to have good eyes. I think that's pretty clear. So I think the issue of metaphor is, is, is the right way to interpret this. But then, you know, where am I drawing this idea of you need the Word of God, you need understanding? Already from Ephesians 4, our darkened understanding relates to the nature of our heart, its ability or inability <clears throat> to recognize what is right and true. But this is an illustration that's used throughout Scripture. You're already thinking of passages, I would imagine. Things like Psalm 119, 105. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Proverbs, uh, excuse me, Psalm 19, 8. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. And here he's going to switch to metaphor. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. Not Not the physical eyes, clearly, but the eyes of the heart. They enable us to see properly. Proverbs 6.23, for the commandment is a lamp and the teaching is a light and reproofs for discipline are a way of life. One of my favorite passages, 2 Peter 1.19, speaking of all of scripture. So we have the prophetic word, that's scripture by the way, the word that God brings directly and then is inscripturated for us through his prophets, through the apostles, through those who wrote scripture. So we have the prophetic word made more sure to which you would do well to pay attention as a lamp shining in a dark place. The word of God illumines the darkness of our hearts and lightens our understanding so that we value things properly and value Christ and we make all of our decisions then based on that renewed intellect, that renewed understanding so we can be wise and pursue the things of God. Jesus is saying you had best have an eye that is clear or you will be stuck pursuing earthly treasures. And in any place your eye isn't clear as it were, as we'll see, in any place where it is dark, not properly understanding scriptural principles, <clears throat> Excuse me. you will be pursuing earthly treasures. That's the devastating picture. Now, you say, okay, the word of God, that's true, but there needs to be something else with that, right? Because lots of people read the word of God and don't properly understand it. There does need to be something else or something along with it, and that is the illumination of the spirit of God. Now to turn to Ephesians 1. So if you were in Ephesians 4, just go back. Ephesians 1, that's why it profits to follow along when we turn. Because now you're just two, two pages away. And I've already referenced this verse, Ephesians 1, 18. Paul says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be, what's the metaphor, enlightened, so that you may know. Again, look what he said. This, this access is the intellect, so that you may know. Now again, not just a bare factual understanding, but the true knowledge to embrace that this is true. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. And this is talking to believers so that you will know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Unless you know that, you will never store up treasures in heaven. You won't know what they are. You won't value them as the riches that they actually are. You'll walk by them thinking they're fool's gold. In fact, the world has its value system exactly opposite, doesn't it? It values the things which are not valuable and holds up as, or it says, the things are worthless that actually have true value. The world says what is light is dark and what is dark is light. The believers know, but they're the only ones. Because it shouldn't surprise you when as you're pursuing the things of God, building up your treasure as it were in heaven, pursuing things according to the principles of Scripture and the power of the Spirit, that the world looks at you and says, you are a fool because they can't see. Their eyes are dark. And in our illustration, as we go back to the text, what does Jesus say? If your eye is dark, dark, then your inner man, the rest of you, the the body is dark, and if everything, if the, if the, the entire eye is bad, or every, your eye is completely blind, how great is the darkness? You can't ever see anything rightly. You can't ever pursue what is right and good. So we need the Spirit of God to use the Word of God as the means by which we are, 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 the Word of God is, is enlightened to us, illumined to us, so that it spreads the light we need in order to walk in a manner that pleases Lord, it's like a double illumination. The Spirit of God enables us to understand it. We can then do it, and it shines a light on our path. What a blessing. Now back to our text in Matthew, the perversion of this sight. So you have, the, you have clarity that is necessary, the clarity of sight, 
which enables us to, to properly value the things of God and pursue true eternal riches, or you have the perversion of sight, but is the strong contrast. If your eye is bad, your whole body will be dark. I mean, again, back to, back to the physical illustration. You've got cataracts over your eyes, you have some disease which keeps your eyes from functioning properly, then you're dark. You, you, you don't actually see anything. Spiritually, it works the same way. If you're ignorant, if, if you do not understand the truths of Scripture, then you can't ever do anything which is full of light that is actually valuable. And then he goes on to say, uh, and, and just, you know, driving this home in the deepest way, if then the light that is in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? The idea that you, what, if what you think is true is actually false, if somehow the blind person were to think that they were actually seeing what a tra- I mean, what an incredible deception that would be. I mean, what, a, what, a, what a vibrant picture of the blind man walking around saying, I see, I see everything, stumbling over things, tripping over things. It w- it, it, it's ridiculous. But how great is the darkness if someone is totally blinded to spiritual things and they say, I see. And who is he referencing? The Pharisee. He called them blind. He said, you think you see. That's exactly what he told them. You think you see, so the darkness is that much greater because you don't even realize you're blind. And that's the picture here. If you think you can see and you're actually blind, there is no greater darkness than that. Oh, that that would be none of you here. Thinking you see and actually being enveloped in darkness. You can't escape that. It does require, of course, in all cases, the work of the Spirit of God crashing into that darkness through the proclaimed word to bring your dead heart to life. You need to cry out to the Lord for that. But even as believers, you guys, we can wrestle, and we do wrestle with darkened understanding. In any place where we do not understand Scripture rightly and well, we will be living out aspects of darkness that that mimic the world, and what a travesty that would be and is. We must constantly be deepening in our understanding of the truths of the Word of God, crying out to the Spirit of God to enable us to understand it. And it goes back to the principle I already discussed. That's wisdom. We say, Lord, I I don't understand these truths. I need you to help me understand them. But then we study them. And and you come on Sunday morning to hear them explained by the Lord's grace. And and you you go on Wednesday night and you listen to people proclaim it. And then you seek to live it out. And you, you discern whether or not you're truly understanding it and then you confess and repent where you aren't, and you do it again and again and again. This takes tremendous effort. Exercising your spiritual eyes to see the truth so that you don't stumble around in the darkness. Proverbs twenty six twelve says, Do you see a man who is wise in his own eyes? There is more hope for a fool than for him. Would that be that that were none of us? I can do this on my own. I understand this. I've got this down apart from the truths of Scripture. So what's... What's the prescription? Well, if you're an unbeliever here this morning, that is, your eyes are darkened from the standpoint that you think you see, but you really don't, and you actually are pursuing the things of the world when you might even be tacking onto it religious things you do, and yet again, what you are finding, if you're sitting here this morning with dark, a darkened heart, is that your joy isn't actually found in the things of God. You're coming, you're doing it, you're trying maybe, and maybe the delight is in your own self-righteousness to do these things, but it isn't a delight in Christ and what he's done and who he is. That doesn't drive you day to day. You get excited a little bit on Sunday morning. You spend the rest of your week wallowed in yourself. What do you need? You need Revelation 3.18. Speaking to a church that was believed themselves to be rich and wise and full of sight, he says this, I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may become rich, the true riches of Christ and white garments so that you may clothe yourselves and, and the shame of your nakedness will not be revealed. They thought they were clothed. They thought they had riches. But it wasn't in Christ. It was in their own work. And, he says, I salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. That's what you need. We need the eye salve of Scripture, of the Spirit of God illuminating it to us that we might see the riches of Christ. That's fundamental to anyone who would even know Christ. But it's Essentially, we need the same thing, or we need, I, I think, maybe continual reapplications of our salve a little bit. We need to keep coming to Christ. We've seen the value of Christ. The Spirit of God remains within us, but we need Him to keep illuminating it for us, to keep anointing our eyes, our spiritual eyes, so that we might see proper, uh, see things in this world with the proper value, not valuing things that are worthless and setting aside the things that are of true value. So the questions I leave you with, Speaking really of the nature of, of 
of the desires, that part of the heart? Do you have a value system which places greatest benefit on the eternal? What delights you? Does the eternal delight you? Or do you, does the temporal delight you? Are you viewing your entire world through that eternal value system? Are you finding and seeing your delights fleshed out in the truths of God's word and, and being with and serving his people? Do you have a clear enough mind to discern what things are truly valuable and capable of bringing proper reward? Do you know the scriptures? Are you deepening so that you actually understand what is truly valuable so you can pursue it? And are you continually pursuing wisdom so that you may have an increasingly clear mind to properly discern which pursuits have greatest value and how best to live them out? That's Jesus' challenge. That's profitable kingdom living here on earth where your heart values and treasures the things that are eternal and your mind understands and pursues the things that have true value. What is your, where is your treasure and what is your vision? Let's pray. Father, thank you for the reality of your word that you've given to us, for the spirit of God who illumines it to us. And I pray that you would help us in light of these truths to carefully consider whether or not we are storing up treasure on earth or treasure in heaven and that you would give us grace and wisdom and insight and discernment to be able to, to live life in such a way that it continually stores up treasures that are eternal, that we would receive the, the full benefit or the, the, the entire benefits of pursuing godly living now, but that we would understand that their, their final reward, their fullest benefit comes when you return. Father, I pray that if there are any here whose eyes are darkened, that they might cry out to you and you might provide them the eye salve that they need to see your beauty, to see their own sin, and to run to you for salvation. In your precious name, Lord Jesus.